In this lesson, we'll combine watercolor and pen and ink applications to create an expressive and experimental image. Now, before we go into the process of creating this art, I want to share a little bit about how I created a focal point in this image, and hopefully you can pick up a couple of things to apply to your own artworks. First of all, this is a deviation from the type of artwork that I normally create. I wanted this artwork to be experimental, juxtaposing the looser watercolor applications with the more linear and defined applications of the pen and ink. I also wanted to create a strong focal point. Focal points are created in a number of ways, and in this image I've used a couple of methods to pull your eye to a specific location. If you look at this image, more than likely your eyes are pulled to this location within the piece. This, of course, is the focal point. Now, there are several things that are happening here in this location to help create a focal point here. First of all, you're naturally going to be pulled to the eyes of another human being. We naturally want to look at people's eyes, so having eyes within a composition is naturally going to create a strong focal point. So clearly, we have eyes there, so we're going to naturally be drawn to that location. But we also have a stroke or a streak of watercolor applications right through the middle here. This is creating a strong diagonal line, as you can see here. We also have a natural line that's created by the arm of the subject. And we're naturally going to be pulled in a location where these two implied lines intersect. This also pulls our eye to this location as the focal point. On top of this, we also have strong contrast that's happening in this location. We have the purples. And we have the yellow that's happening right here. Purple and yellow are complementary colors, so this strong contrast is also going to help pull a viewer's eye to this location. Now, of course, having focal points is important in any drawing or painting, but the location of these focal points is equally important. We want to make sure that these focal points are in a, an aesthetically successful location. We can ensure this by using the rule of thirds. Basically, the rule of thirds means that you are subsecting the picture plane down into thirds. And each one of these thirds can be thought of as a line. For example, if I was to divide the paper vertically using the rule of thirds, we can see that our focal point here lines up with the third on the left side of the picture plane. We can also use the rule of thirds to divide the paper horizontally. When these lines are added, we can see that we have an intersection point right here. This is very close to our area of the focal point anyway, so naturally this is going to be an aesthetically successful location to place a focal point. So now let's get into the process of how this artwork was created. We'll begin with a light graphite sketch on 140 pound Arches cold press watercolor paper. We're going to begin by locating the areas of highlight and we're going to use masking fluid to preserve these areas so that we can make watercolor washes over the top and these areas will not be disturbed. Now it's important to use an old brush that you really don't care much about to use the masking fluid since it is rubber based and it will ruin your brush. Uh, so after these applications are made. Unfortunately, I have to throw this brush away. You can see that the masking fluid has a little bit of an orange tint to it. This is just a little bit of pigmentation that will allow us to know where we've placed the masking fluid. Now we're going to start with a watercolor brush loaded with water and I'm just going to map out areas where I want a bit of color initially. We're going to try to create an intersection right at the eyes, a visual intersection, which will help pull our viewers eye to that location. Now in the areas of heavy water applications, I can start adding a bit of color. I'm going to use a bit of phthalo blue, a touch of Prussian blue mixed with alizarin crimson to create this purple. And we'll allow this application to go over the body of the figure. And then we'll just lightly lift up some of this color with a paper towel. We want to have a little bit of the purplish undertones happening there, but we don't want them to be too dominant. While we still have quite a bit of the color on the brush, we're going to make a few paint splatters here and there. Then we'll continue some of those purple applications right over the shoulder of the subject. And while our area is still wet, we'll add a little bit more of the alizarin crimson and some more of the purple mixture to add some reds. This color will spread since the surface is wet and create some interesting transitions. We'll also add a few more paint splatters. These are always fun to do.
And then since we don't want too many of the paint splatters on the figure, we'll go back with the brush loaded with water and just wet these areas and then gently lift them with a paper towel. Now we can start applying some of the skin tones on the face. This is a mixture of yellow ochre, a touch of cadmium red, and just a bit of burnt umber. We're going to go ahead and cover all of the skin tone areas initially with this color. Now you might notice that I'm not going to fill in the entire figure here. For this piece, which is an experimental piece, I want to have a strong contrast between the looser watercolor applications and then the pen and ink line applications that we'll apply later in the process. But I don't want to fill up the body completely with watercolor applications. Instead, I want it to appear like there's a streak, a diagonal streak going across the body with watercolor applications to enhance the contrast between the line art that we'll apply later. Now we're going back with a darker version of our skin tone. This is the same skin tone mixture with just a little bit more of the burnt umber mixed in. While the surface is still wet, we'll just touch the brush in several areas to create a slightly darker value. This will allow this color to spread out since the water will pull it. Now the surface is beginning to become a little bit damp, not so much saturated. So we're going to go back and apply some of the colors, the initial colors for the beard. This of course is dominated by burnt umber, the dark brown. We'll also pull in some of the purples and blues that we have in the background. So we'll use a little bit of our purple mixture to start developing some of the shadows on the neck. Now we'll allow some of our skin tone locations to dry a bit. And while we allow that to happen, we'll start working on the shirt. We'll mix a bit of Prussian blue with a touch of burnt umber to produce this blue green color. And we'll apply it to the area of the shirt. We'll leave a couple of open spaces to indicate a few highlights. We'll also add a bit of skin tone to the arm since this is in our streak of color that we're creating through the middle. Now that our skin tone has allowed to dry on the face, we can go back and layer applications over the top. Now this is when we're going to start to really develop the darker values and in essence the details. So we'll go back with a mixture that's heavily dominated with burnt umber. There's a bit of Prussian blue in here too to make it even darker. We'll address the eyebrow and some of the darker values around the eye and along the nose. These applications are going to appear darker, but as they dry, they'll lighten up. We'll also start to darken up some of the values of the beard as well. Of course, there are, are many different shadows that happen in the hand, around the fingers, and underneath the fingers, and most of the hand actually is in shadow. So we'll start with our darker mixture to indicate a few of the wrinkles, and then we'll allow that mixture to become dominant with the Prussian blue, allowing some more of those cooler tones to happen on the fingers and on the lower palm of the hand. With watercolor, it's a gradual process of developing the complexity in the color. So one of the advantages to using watercolor, of course, is we can add light translucent washes of different colors to build up that complexity. So as you can see here, we're adding a bit of alizarin crimson to the bottom portions of the fingers and also the palm of the hand. And these colors will just layer over the top of each other, allowing some of the color underneath to show through, leading to that complexity. Here we'll use a little bit of burnt sienna mixed with burnt umber to create some of the shadows on the left side of the face. And then we'll use our darker mixture, again burnt umber with a touch of Prussian blue mixed in to start darkening up the values in the beard. We'll allow a few breaks to happen here and there to indicate some of the texture. Now that the sections around the eye has dried completely, we can go back in again with our darker mixture of burnt umber and Prussian blue and start to develop the details even further. We'll add a pupil and some indications of some eyelashes and some of the darker tones and values that exist around the eye. We'll also darken up the shadow on the side of the nose again. Then we can go back to our hand. We'll indicate some of the fingernails and make some of the shadows underneath the fingers a little bit darker. As you can see here, I'm bouncing around from section to section. This allows me to let a section dry completely before revisiting it. 
At this point, we're addressing some of the shadows of the neck, and you can see there's quite a bit of the purple undertones that we created earlier in the process included in this shadowed area. Progressively, we'll add a little bit more of the purple to develop the shadows. Some of the shadows on the lower portion of the ear are also addressed here. And you can see right in the middle of the ear, this is where we're going to have the cutout point on the top part where we have watercolor and then line art. Now that our shirt's been allowed to dry, we'll go down there and apply some of the darker values. Again, this is the same mixture of Prussian blue, just this time a little bit more dominant with the burnt umber. Now we can begin increasing the contrast on the face and we'll darken up the shadow on the left side of the face. This is a mixture of our dark purple that we created with a bit more of the burnt umber mixed in. We'll use this color down on the neck as well. This light translucent wash over the top will allow the colors and values that we created underneath to show through. We'll add a little bit of alizarin crimson to the inside portion of the eye and in various locations of the face and the hands. And whenever you add a color in one location, it's usually a good idea to add it in another location to help harmonize the piece. So that's what we're doing with the alizarin crimson. We'll also continue to darken up some of the shadows on the palm of the hand, again increasing that contrast between the light and the dark. Here a bit of alizarin crimson is added underneath the neck as well. Once we've allowed the watercolor enough time to dry, we can go back and remove the masking fluid that we had in place earlier in the process. The masking fluid is easily removed by just rubbing with your finger. If you find it hard to lift with your finger, you can also use an eraser to remove it. Then we're gonna go back and start adding some color to the highlighted areas that we preserved. We'll use a bit of cadmium yellow pale hue for this. This yellow will contrast the purple nicely since yellow and purple are complementary colors. Then we'll go back with a bit of burnt umber and start developing some of the details on the right eye, especially the shadows around the eye. We'll bring some of those darker values back to the fingers and the palm of the hand as well, just to make the shadows a bit darker and increase the contrast. We'll do the same on the side of the nose, just to make the edge of the nose a little bit more visible. And then we'll define the line or the edge of the shirt again with our mixture of burnt umber and a bit of Prussian blue. All right, now that our watercolor applications have dried again, we're ready to start addressing the line art. I'm gonna be using a micron pen for this and I'll start with a 01 tipped pen here. This is a very fine line. We're not gonna to be too concerned about developing the values, but we are going to make lines that indicate the texture. So this means that we're going to be creating a bunch of lines in the area where we have hair, and that's on the beard and the hair on the head. But for the rest of the figure, we're just gonna be defining the edge of the subject. We are gonna put a few textural lines around the collar of the shirt and the sleeves of the shirt, and we'll also put a few textural lines on the sofa that he's sitting on. But other than that, we're just gonna be concentrating on defining the edges with the line. We could, of course, use hatching and cross hatching or maybe stippling to develop a range of value, but for this drawing, we wanna create a strong contrast between the line art and the looser watercolor application. Applications. If we were to go back and add cross hatching or hatching or even stippling to add some of the values in the areas that we don't have watercolor applications, it may distract from the diagonal stroke of watercolor going through the scene. And of course, this is very important because we're trying to create a focal point in the areas of the eyes. So we don't want to distract from that watercolor application. As we add the lines for the hair, we're considering the direction that the hair grows. These lines that we make here should flow in the direction that the hair flows. This is true even for the beard. Uh, you can see here that the lines turn and go underneath the beard on the underside of the beard. We'll also add a few textural marks for the collar and the sleeves just to add a bit more interest. And then we'll go back and add a little bit of line quality or line variety. We're gonna thicken up the line on the back side of the shirt and the edge of the sofa. 
Then we'll add a textured pattern to the sofa, again just to add a bit more interest and some visual weight down on the bottom portion of the picture plane. And now our experimental drawing using watercolor and pen and ink is complete. If you're ready to learn more about drawing and painting, then check out our comprehensive membership program, which includes video courses, weekly live lessons, eBooks, lesson plans for teachers, and much, much more. To learn more about our program, just click on the card in the upper right hand corner or visit thevirtualinstructor.com forward slash members today. And if you'd like to check out three of our course modules for free, you can do so by joining our mailing list. Just click on the link you see here on your screen. You'll get access to three of our course modules, which includes videos and eBooks. And of course, you'll get updates when new lessons are posted on the website. And if you're watching this on YouTube, make sure that you subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching.